What you've just been listening to is uh, an excerpt from uh, Waiting for You by Yoad Nevo and Nina Smith, which is part of our Sonic 001 compilation album. And this is a series of interviews in which we talk to the people behind those tracks. So uh, we're talking to Yoad Nevo at Nevo Sound. How are you, Yoad? Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. Excellent. Glad to hear it. Uh, of course, Yoad is quite a regular on Sonic Talk, which is why he was one of the contributors. But he's also kind of, you know, mixes and produces for a living. So it's unsurprising that it sounded so good. And that's the one thing, Yoad, that many people have said that listen to it. And it was the one thing that I found myself is when I heard it, I thought, mm, I really need to go back and fix my mix. It's not quite as good as yours. So I'm hoping that we can uh, find out some of your uh, little secrets there. But uh, it's quite a minimal track, right? It's a very minimal track and uh, actually, I hate to say it, but it's not even a mix. So basically, it's a writing session that I bounced. Um, I, I did work on it a little bit later on some of the vocal effects and, and you know, uh, octaves and, and things like that. But the track itself, I don't know, took maybe two, three hours from from nothing to to what you're hearing now, except for some chopping that I did later and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a quickie. Wow. I have to say. That's often, yeah, that's often uh, the best way, isn't it? I mean, it just kind of, because then you're in stream of consciousness. So this was, this was the right, because I was going to ask how it was written. So how did you write? Because it's obviously got guitar on it. Did you sort of start with you sitting there and, you know, it's almost like round the piano kind of uh, vibe or how did that work? Uh, so Nina and myself uh, write a lot together and we've written loads of songs uh, for other artists uh, as well as for Nina. Uh, and this is one of them. And we just, uh, I don't know, we just jam and something happens. Uh, I think that I uh, started with with a beat and then I found this um preset on hive which i then tweaked a bit wow that looks massive on this low resolution is that is uh, that the bass no that's ah. so i kind of started with that just and and basically that dictated the whole harmonic structure of the song which is uh made only of two chords but uh it could have been um taken in a different direction but for some reason it inspired me to do kind of a sort of a bondy guitar you know sound yeah. uh, which i used the gtr for and i'm actually i thought i heard an octave it, octave in there yeah so without the octave it would sound like that Wow. Yeah, it's just a... Uh, and it's quite, you know, it's played quite messy because I can say because it was intentional, but it probably wasn't. <laughs> uh, and yeah, and we, the octave gives it a little bit... So it that's gives it so much. It gives it so much bottom end because I was thinking, well, it's, it takes it occupies so much space, but and it's literally. Yeah. So what, what's this? This is G, GT, GTR tool rack. Is that a, um, that's that, a wave yeah, thing, right? Pa that's part of the GTR with the with the amps and uh, and stuff, and that's the octave, and I can basically mute the the direct. Um, and then you can hear just the octave. So it's basically a square wave, which mm. is essentially what all octaves are. And that's why they sound so brilliant, because it's not a uh, um, harmonizer. It's not like a pitch uh, shift on the sound. It's actually counting the zero crossing. It's like a tuner in, uh, in a way and generating, like missing every other ah, okay. zero crossing and creating a square wave uh, out of that so that's why that's why they're so easily easily kind of um you know uh miss trigger or you know because if you try to p play anything polyphonic it wouldn't work 
Right. So and, it's, it's uh, if you if you if, you if you're playing dirty, it'll kind of get confused and try and try and yeah. make an octave to something that's because it's based on pitch detection. It's a very very I wouldn't call it even pitch. It is pitch detection, but it's very primitive. It's nothing like the pitch detection, you know, that we use on on vocal correction or uh, pitch shifting and and things like that in monophonic mode or in vocal mode. Um, so this wants to, it, it's a counter, it counts the zero crossings and they right. have, if there's more, you know, harmonics or even more, not to mention more fundamentals on the same, uh, zero crossing, like it will mess it up. And that's why you get those jumps sometimes. Interesting. Anyway. So uh, is most of the processing happening in GT or have you got kind of other stuff across the channel? GTR. Or your, GTR, sorry. Uh, no, that's the only thing that's wow. on the guitar. There's a little bit of reverb, chorus. This is not even doing anything. This is not even doing anything. Uh, and the amp. Um... <laughs> Yeah, the reverb is kind of just to give it a bit of sparkle, but it wants to be kind of, you know, that 60s kind of um, mm. Bondy sound. Interesting. Yeah. It occupies so much space. I mean, the thing is, is about this this bit, yeah, this mix, there's so many, I mean, this is just sort of one, but it adds this massive kind of human quality. And, and the thing that I found really interesting about because I've listened to this on multiple systems, I mean, every time I listen to it on a different thing, whether it's Buds or my small speakers bit, I'm hearing something else. And this seems to be, I mean, I'm, I'm amazed that there's so much in it because it feels like it's very playful. There's lots of kind of, you're having a lot of fun with it. I mean, there's some really interesting little sort of creaky sounds, which almost sound like you are on the stool while you're playing the guitar, getting so into it that the stool is starting to creak like a, like a knackered old drum stool. And I, it, that's the implication of it. I don't know whether you got the same vibe from that, but it makes it feel really sort of uh, like... You yeah, know. in a way, but in, in kind of an electronic way. So it's almost like the robot is moving and uh, needs some oiling or something. Yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, that's uh, that's the vibe. And, and because it's so... There's not much in it. So I wouldn't say you can hear the spaces because it would sound corny and awful, but... Uh, sort of uh, and even the you know in the beginning i have in the intro i have this you know which in context sounds like a human I it sounds that, like like nina was doing that yeah that's what I, that's what that's what i would have actually said had happened but it's that's not the case right <laughs> right no so so in the track you hear this kind of And yeah. and all it is, all it is, is a sine wave with a beat crusher. So it's a sine wave with a bit oh, of bend wow. on the front, and with with some. Um, it's not a beat crusher. It's basically a down sample. Right. So without uh, without anti-aliasing filter. So you get the. Extra harmonics, right? Yeah. So basically, these are the high harmonics that it can't handle. That's really and interesting. And it folds them down. But it really sounds like ooh. Yeah. Wow. It's the you know what the the, the aliasing is basically the the equivalent of you know in the westerns when you see the um the carriage and you see the wheels kind of turning backwards that's exactly what it is the the harmonics that it can't the pitch it can't generate it basically folds it down and it creates extra wow. extra so um uh, extra harmon lower harmonics that's really interesting um, so uh so there's there's three voices only because i wanted to pan them So it's, you know, that's why I was referring to the robot because it's quite electronic. Yeah, but and, I, I really and... thought I really thought that that was a vocal sample and that you'd built. This is why it's so weird. Now you're saying that it's it was actually came from a jam because I thought, well, you must, you know, maybe the vocal was recorded, you know, in a somewhat, you know, not all oh, the song was written and recorded with somebody just playing along with a guitar and then you kind of manipulated those elements of the vocal, but it's not the case at all. No. Yeah, I named it vocal sample as well because it sounds like like one 
Uh, yeah, and then on the group, there's a little bit of um, um, exciter, which uh, so without it, it sounds a little bit more dull. But for some reason, I mean, it adds the high harmonics, and it sounds makes it sounds sound a little bit more human because it's kind of gritty. Well, not when you solo it. It sounds like. No, it's, it's like really, what it is, but that's really strange. It's, it's really, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because I mean, in many ways, I don't know if you, because you, you must have mixed loads of stuff, and you probably it, your ears probably, you know, obviously more finely tuned than many. But sometimes when you hear a multi or you hear a song, and you think. Oh, I can't wait to hear that song. And then you solo the track. It's like, well, that's not what happened at all. That's not what in my head I thought that track was going to be. But it's the sort of combination of those. Interesting. Yeah, sometimes the sum is greater than the, you know, the I- tracks or the ingredients that that you have uh, in the production. Um, yeah, and it's it's really all very basic and simple. There's, there's some uh, some drum samples here. There's two kicks. One right. is so that's quite the the first one sounds like a sort of double skin bass drum with a little bit of drop bit behind it. Yeah. How, I'm curious because the thing that struck me about this and many other people's mixes was how mono it made my mix feel and it was kind of trying to figure out how how do you get that kind of stereo there because also with the bass which is just the big first note, you know, at the beginning. Is that mm-hmm. all just Eva? Because it sounds like there's some sort of super saw yeah, or hive. detune stuff in there going on there. Uh, sorry, hi, from there's, Piggy Pond. There's, there's a, just a tiny bit of, of EQ on there. Uh, I, I tweaked it quite a bit. I don't remember what the... Uh, oh, that that was the original... Right. Um, original preset, pad. and yeah. I tweaked it. Yeah. But it, yeah, it sounds, you know, it makes a song. Sometimes you 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 find one preset that that makes the whole the whole thing. Also, I think that the fact that the hi hat, it isn't playing continuously. Yeah. So it has that kind of stop every time. There's a lot of there's a lot of implied rhythm in it as well. Yeah, and you but you know as far as as drums, you can't get any more simple than that, I don't think. Uh, there's a little bit of um, kind of ear candies here and there. Yes, I wonder that's about that like a, Yeah, that's like a kind of... A, yeah, there's a little kind of post-production elements. And I think that what this is, is basically... Actually, we can... We can listen to the original sample if I copy it here. And oh, I just chopped it and moved it. Yeah, and reversed uh, it by the looks to, of it. Yeah. So the sample. Just a kick. Oh, it's the same kick. <laughs> it's the same kick. <laughs> economy. Yeah. Economy. Nothing like a bit of economy there. Um. So the other thing is there's there's quite a lot of go- going on with the vocal. So is it just a single vocal? Did she double track? Because there's harmonies and there's very quiet little sort of uh, multiple part harmonies as well as the octaves. And there seemed to be a really weird, uh, almost breathy white noise undercurrent to some of the phrases as well. Um, yeah, so I think that, as you can see, the vocal is not even edited. I'm just wow. using a bit of... I'm just using the expander on uh, on the R channel, on the Renaissance channel, which I use a lot, um, usually in conjunction with editing. So I would edit the vocals and then it will kind of um, smoothen it. But here, and also this was recorded just here by the desk. Uh, Nina was just sitting here and I have an old... Um, an old Fostex mic, which is a Poor People's uh, 58, basically, which I which I bought when I couldn't afford the 58. Wow. So that was... Uh, You've had it a yeah, while then. Some time, some time ago, yeah. And, um, and the reason I keep it here, it's not here today, but the reason I keep it here is that it has a switch. And that's very um, right. convenient when you're writing, 
you know, you don't want to get feedbacks and stuff like that. So you can just put it on the, so it's always on and it's in, it, it goes to the speakers with, with guitars or whatever we, we're doing. And then I can just, um, I can just hit record and, and capture it. And I think if I'm not, yeah. So if, if I solo, if I take out all the plugins and, and boost the gain, um, I think the, the speakers was. Yeah, so even the, the speakers are on, so it's not even with headphones or anything. <laughs> um, it's uh, well, very it's whatever, raw. Whatever, whatever works, isn't it, really? In many, but particularly if this is a writing session. I mean, I remember there was all this kind of hoo-ha, wasn't there, that uh, I think the first people that, that kind of publicised this when, when production was being kind of, techniques were being kind of spoken about a bit more openly, it was uh, Bono in front of the, the big speakers with a, with an SM57 and the out-of-phase yeah. trick and all of that, just to kind of get the vibe in the yeah. room, I guess. Yeah, I used to I used to do that, uh, and it's not fun for the for the singers. So basically, you put um, a speaker like an NS10 or something like that here for the singer, and they can sing, and then and they sing to it, so they don't have to use headphones, and they can uh, you know be more free and uh, and also pitch better because yeah. you, you have to either take one ear out or it's really difficult to pitch uh to headphones because you're used to you're hearing it straight to the to you know to your skull and it's yeah. a different perception of of pitch um so a lot of people like singing to uh without headphones and then what you do is you 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 record the takes and then you ask the singer to stand there for the entire take and you record just that so you have the 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 crosstalk you have the the leakage from the speakers uh, you just and then the phase you on that. phase reverse it after you comp your track you can uh phase reverse it and uh obviously it wouldn't get rid of the room tone and noises and fans or whatever you have in the control room which you don't in the live room uh but yeah i i didn't obviously i didn't even bother doing that here <laughs> um i mean i i you know i i monitor the <laughs> When I record, because a lot of times in, in writing session, like I try, during writing sessions, I try to get the vocal in such a way that it it's usable. Yeah. And that's the case. That's what happened here. So I monitor very quietly on the speakers. As you can hear that it's not very loud. Uh, the singers may not enjoy it, but at least I know that I you can, can use capture it. a performance that... Uh, well, because the, tempta the temptation when you're writing is to turn it up to get the vibe, isn't it? So you can kind of just kind of get the endorphins going and whatnot. And then, and, yeah. and also a minute before, just uh, you, you hear, you, you know, we've all heard it and like loud and, and nice. And we said, OK, let's just recall that. And then I turn it down. So it's a little bit of a buzz killer. Right. But uh, well, sure, I mean, I have to do my my engineering duties. The thing that I found really interesting as well, because there's so much, I mean, there's a lot in the vocals. She obviously sings really interestingly across the rhythms with the sort of dotted triplets and all that kind of, it's really interesting kind of rhythmic, but there's lots of processing. And I, I, I assumed that there would be a lot of vocal production going on because have you got, a, did she sing the octave or did you put the octave in? Uh, so so I'll, I'll show you the only unusual. So here we have just um, a comp To persuade you that. Okay, let's. Have it just with a normal. Actually, let's hear it without anything. Anything. So that's how it was recorded. Ah, sorry. There's something on it. Okay. Right. Wow, that's a transformation, isn't it? A normal vocal. I use a deesser. Which is not doing much here, but in the louder sections, maybe, yeah, a little bit. And you can hear the pops as well from the mic. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Then a bit of compression that, that gives it uh, also some level. You got it up, but I will break through. 
and 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 then I compress the hell out of it uh, <laughs> with the RDS, which I which I really like with with short attack. So it kind of and that kind of kills the those pops. Ooh, disapprove, disapprove, but I'll be waiting right wow, here that for is a you, massive transformation for you. There. Why is it suddenly worth it? Yeah, but you can hear that it brings up the the S's. There's quite an extra. There's quite an extreme cut because I mean one of the things that I found when I was first starting out, when I was first brought into a studio, I assumed that you weren't supposed to use thing extreme settings on things. You know, you tried to keep everything really subtle. The idea was you would capture the beauty of the recording, and then all you'd have to do is these tiny tweaks. But actually, what I think most a lot of people who perhaps don't have a lot of experience. There's a, there's a, you can go quite far in terms of, you know, like, like here, for instance, there's, you know, quite a lot of EQ on that and there's quite a lot of compression. You've transformed the sound quite radically with that and that's okay, right? Uh, listen, it's all, uh, when you have a shitty mic, you have to, to do stuff. To it, <laughs> right. You know, if you have a pure mic and a, like I usually record, but there's something about that as well. Also, it's not that much, like 5 dB. Right at the top is not it's not extreme. a massive it's not a massive amount and to cut um everything below uh 300 wow that's quite extreme uh but yeah i mean she sings i don't know i just do whatever whatever, whatever, I whatever need it to do. and it all does fit together really well i mean that's the thing about this mix is it kind of feels again i come back to the fact that it's it you know, it was done at speed, but it feels there's a lot of instinct in it, and a, like I say, a lot of playfulness. But there was some other stuff going on in the vocal. So what's happening with the harmonisation and the and that stuff? I'm curious. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll get to that. The the one thing that's really important to mention is that so I usually use two DSs. So one makes sure that the, that there aren't ones that are really really loud. So it kind of only only picks on the on the really loud ones and and leaves the 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 normal right. ones alone um and then with the compression and everything and this eq they will get louder God is up, but I will... so without the second dsa God is up, but I will break through disapproved it. you can hear those s's are really really sharp and that and that's why you need another dsa which works quite Hard. The God is up, but them. I will break through. Disapprove, disapprove. But I'll be waiting right here for you. But uh, yeah, uh, and then I have some uh, enhancing on the high. We confused. Is it something I can do? To right, and, and and you know, with that type of vocal approach, you really don't need all those uh, those lows. You know, so you yeah. can easily. We confused. Is there you know, something just... I can do to persuade you that my love is gold? I'd walk across. And it gives it a bit more, a bit of attitude as well. Um, here I'm using, um, basically, I'm just boosting, I'm just increasing the formant ah, on, the, okay, that's on the vocal by one. So that makes it kind of robotic. And... confused. Is there something I can do? Persuade you that my love is gold. I'd that's an interesting technique for you. That sounds like quite a yeah, modern obviously. sort. Of, yeah, that's that's yeah, interesting. I'd not I'd not come across that. Yeah, before. I mean, um, I I I think I did it just before we released the the vocal bender, which uh, is a similar plugin by Waves that that doesn't have the that jittery kind of artifact, but. Uh, but that works. Confused. Is there something I can do? But also you can see that since, as opposed to the octave, this one is based on pitch detection. So you can uh, hear what you what it does on the breath. Are you weak? On on this, <sighs> on that section yeah. here, it kind of really it doesn't know what to do with it. <laughs> Ah, it okay. really crumbles it, yeah. Um, because it just can't, you know, there's no pitch, or maybe it thinks it's a very low pitch, so it drops the whole thing, and you right. get 
Well, it's you like that, the, same tra- the same technique. It's when when the technology can't do it. I mean, no, you know, it's a very different effect. But uh, Goldfrapp on Lovely Head singing into the MS-20, which can't really cope with a high vocal range tracking. Mm-hmm. And when it sort of breaks and can't handle the swoops, yeah. or it, that makes it sound really organic and quite interesting. And technology can then become almost organic in sound as well. Yeah, it's all the it's all the digital nastinesses that we never wanted, but uh, but sometimes there's a vibe to it. In the same way that uh, you know, in the old days, tapes me- meant hiss and stuff, and yeah. and now it's coming back, uh, and and vinyl cracker crackles and and things like that. Is there a sub octave? Yeah, there? there's there other stuff. So, uh, yeah, there's a sub octave. There's a, a slap delay. <laughs> Is there something I can do to persuade? And there's my what I call earrings. Basically, it's that thing. So it's a. Uh, it's like an exciter channel almost. Yeah, it's basically a high pass and, and a lot of compression that goes to a doubler. Uh, that cuts again all the lows and and the the settings are somewhat uh, based on the AMS RMX uh, fifteen right which is uh, uh, DMX fifteen sorry right uh, which is the famous uh, harmonizer ah. so this is what I used to do to use on the on the AMS um, so so that gives it a little bit of kind of stereoness and then uh, let me bring that back and then here i think that that's what you're referring to this yeah that's so really so up. here that that's a vocoder and i'm i'm just using the noise ah. so the noise is basically shaped on the on the on the vocal uh, vowels or right you know of it gets the filter shape from the from um and then it's it's automated so it's not on the whole thing it's just on this break Why are we confused? Is there something I can do to persuade you that my love is over? and then and then it's gone um but that's a nice trick that that you know that I use sometimes uh you can also create a really nice uh, sort of fake reverb out of that. Oh, that you... walk across the world. You can put it through your smile. Carry on taking your time. I'll be waiting right here for you. Even if right. things are miserable, you got it. So you know you can you can do a lot of uh, creative stuff with uh, with the vocoder noise. That's really um, so. I mean, it sounds like um, you know, if it was me, that that would have probably ended up being in the track for the whole time rather than that just one little point. And it seems like there's lots of these little ear candy moments, and it's knowing where to spread them out and when when they're required. Because I mean, it'd be tempting just to keep them in there or use them because it's like, oh, I'm really proud of the way that sounds. Let's have that a bit more front and center. But uh, you you've been very tastefully uh, um, restrained. Well, <laughs> thanks. And what about that harm? Because I did hear some harmonies in there that sounded like they were more yeah. than one part. I'm sure. So, so, so that again is um, the the. It's a similar chain, only here I'm using the vocal. So that's the octave. That's the the low octave. Right. Ah. Okay. And. Uh, Tired of closing curtains, I wanna open up to sunshine. And here I'm using the vocal rider so it keeps it at the same level without it sounding um, compressed bef- yeah. even yeah. before the compression. So uh, so it's easier for the detector to 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 get it right, uh, and and it sounds more solid. And then it's just an octave, a, a straight octave, so that the performance goes with the pitch. So that's why it sounds like half speed. There's something. Is there something and, stereo kind of? There's something moving in the stereo yeah. image there as well, right? Yeah, there's a bit of a spreader. Yeah, uh, a bit of. It's like an an ensemble effect. Um, yeah, and together they they kind of work. 
already throw you a smile Carry on taking your time I'll be waiting right here for you And again here, I, I it's easier to, rather than put it on a, on a send, I usually copy, I just copy the track uh, and, and then, uh, the and then like, I yeah. can, yeah. yeah. Why are we confused? Is there something I can do to persuade you that my love is going yeah. to walk across the world for you? Yeah, and that's a I really good I trick, actually, by duplicate rather than automating all of that stuff. And you just basically copy to another track and just put the, I, the regions I, where I you want them to go. I do it a lot. The downside is More that tracks. if you, <laughs> if you no, no, I don't. I'm, that's not a problem. the 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 thing is that if you if you then edit the vocal and you want yeah. it to be to get reflected in that, then. Um, you know, automating the send will uh, to the octave would would be more flexible. Yeah, I see. Um, there's there's a bit of a harmony here. For you. Ah, so that's a, that's that's okay. Like, that's yeah. a harmony I've created from the from the lead vocal. So she only sang it once. I thought I remember there were harmonies, but so that's a, a fifth up basically, and um. And I'm just uh, kind of messing with the foreman to make it a little bit more. Even if they tell me to move, God is up, but I will break through. Got it. Yeah. So, and, and together with the octave, it's kind of interesting even if they tell me to move i guess the thing is the trick is with this is like when you're listening to the even in solo it's actually you know i mean it's it's extreme processing but it's sort of it's it's not really really in your face it's just enough to kind of make you kind of go oh what's that that's really uh, and and again it's the sort of subtlety of it because even with so few elements you're still being quite restrained in the balance of some of those things just to kind of create this uh, continual movement and evolution, right? Um, yeah, uh, well put. I, uh, I mean, uh, I think that it's mostly because I was very much aware of the low fidelity of the vocal recording right. uh, that I was trying to hide it and and do stuff, and that led to to some creative, uh, you know. Um, elements and and here there's some there's some harmonies ah okay yeah but, the middle eight so there's some really interesting sounds in there yeah so i basically f just f oops just faded them so you know essentially it just she her doing this. but i wanted it to sound kind of reversey and spooky where is it nice so, that's why i was like, what's that mid synth mid synth that's that was interesting to me because that that's really it's i mean heavily distorted but also pads which is quite an unusual approach as well um yeah again it's the hive and i'm do i'm using a sort of uh side chain thing on it a side chain effect i should say right but it's, but it's uh, pretty it's, i mean it's, it's not... only yeah just a um it's only preset, which I may have tweaked or, or not. I don't remember. Um, <laughs> Is that a motorcycle car? going past? <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah. Ah, that's the, those are the snare. Those are the creaks that I was wondering about. Yeah. Um, And you're using quite a lot of interesting kind of timings on the repeats there. Yeah, this is just... Um, 
yeah, you know, kind of. I think I, yeah, I used the machine for that. Um, and uh, and this this is kind of doing a, an interesting uh, polyrhythm. Yeah. And there's the this, which is a sample. Nice. With a bit of reverb. Um, ah. Ah, so there is some automation going. I mean, do, are you big on automation? Do you do a lot of automation in mix? I mean, is that a key to kind of... I, on vocals, I do loads, usually. Uh, unless I can get away with just compressing it so hard that, right. you know, it doesn't have anywhere to go. Um, um, but And, yeah, on, on kind of events and stuff, yeah, sometimes I can spend hours on just one transition or something. Um, uh, what's, he, what's that? Yeah, there's lots of things. Oh, yeah, that's doing another. Yeah, another off. Persuade you that my love is old. I'd walk across the world for you. Yeah, some. And that just, in, that again, that enhances the, the, the timing of the vocal that's kind of playing against the beat as well. Uh, what's also really interesting is all of, a lot of these little sort of ticky and high-end stuff is very specifically in a kind of frequency pocket. It's not... You know, you made it very, very small, but so you can still hear it. Uh, yeah, you don't need big explosions and things here. Um, to be honest, it's probably some samples that I just pulled that pulled up and and didn't do anything to them, so they don't, you know, so they don't sound like too bombastic. There's a little bit of a of a kind of pitch flow. Ah, okay, yeah. Which, you know, so we, without that, it sounds... Uh, that yeah. Gives it, you know, it's it, it gets into, it's getting into kind of timing territories. And um, because so on, the, on the chorus, on every beat, you've got this kind of big sort of dropping. Is that what those are doing? Or am I hearing something else there? Um, it's probably that. No. Again, this on the is snare. Like three. On the snare. Dun, dun, dun. On the snare. Yeah, on the snare beat. Let's see rather. what comes in. Then. That's it. Yeah. And you're using the pitch envelope again there to. It just as yeah, and the just a normal snare, but really distorted. Right. Uh, together. Ah, that's the kick. So the kick is is doing that as, you know, giving it that skip in the yeah. chorus, which kind of. Yeah, and I have this. I completely forgot about it, but it's doing something. I mean, because you, 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 you kind of when you deliver this. I mean, what, where does it go? What's on your sort of master bus? Where, did, but, but, you know, and how much is that doing? How much is that contributing to the overall uh, vibe of the the final sound? Um, it, yeah, it does because especially on a quick thing like that, uh, I just throw in. I even use the Logic uh, high pass filter, which. Interesting. Uh, I normally don't uh, tape uh, the NLS, which is a, de a, a console um, emulation. And I think that the, the main thing here, so this is not, these are not really doing too much, uh, but I think the main thing here is the 
the compressor on the bus, which uh, really works. So that's yeah. 4 dB of compression on the impacts, and it kind of glues it together, uh, and it becomes a part of the production, because if I'll take it off... It has it has a different flow, and this one is more kind of urgent. Yeah, it sort of almost adds a kind of a, pul a pulsing rhythm to the to the accenting as well. It's interesting, right? Uh, well, so I was meaning to ask you some other questions, like you know, so you you play the guitar on this, right? So that was your. Uh, you're in because you, you yeah start... I, play, I I did the I did the track and the beat and you know everything uh, apart from the from the vocals uh, which Nina wrote and sang obviously so you're you did you start so, so out my... as a guitarist is that where your kind of musical life began playing guitar I I started playing guitar yeah when I was ten uh, and when I was eleven I. My dad got me uh, an electric guitar, but um, I had no amp. Uh, <laughs> he only got me a, bought me an amp a bit later. So, um, so I, I was I had one jack lead which I cut one end of and exposed the the wires, and I tried to connect it to anything that can possibly make sound right. in the house. <laughs> um and so if you could say that that was the beginning of my engineering career sound engineering career and and it always went hand in hand so it was the playing but f trying to find ways of uh i even had um like a kind of a, a, a race track with um i like scale extracts you know yeah. like a matchbox cars yeah, yeah it was a thing that you stuck onto the uh, to the boat to the bottom of the matchbox card and it matchbox car uh, car and it was uh, and it had this um controller which was i remember that basically yeah. a dimmer right and so i i so i took it apart and i connected it between the the stereo amp and the speakers so i can crank the amp really loud and and have this on really low so I can get distortion sound. Of course, I blew up the the amp, and this thing started um, <laughs> smoking, you know, <laughs> smoking and, and stuff. And I got electrocuted many times. Um, yeah, I didn't know what I was doing, but I was uh, having a lot of fun. Interesting. So when did you when did you get into the kind of into the studio proper and you know that that kind of journey? I get. Did you have the fairly traditional route of kind of assistant or T boy assistant, and then you know. Uh, for a little while, I mean, I, uh, when I was uh, 16 or 17, I took uh, an engineering course, basically. It, was, uh, it wasn't like a proper engineering uh, school, you know, that you go um, study for three years or anything like that. It was one year, but it was twice a week in the afternoon. Um, and, and the manager uh, told me that the studio... Uh, a, a big studio in Tel Aviv uh, was looking for uh, a runner, basically. Right. And he recommended me out of everyone in the course. And uh, yeah, and uh, that's how I started. Um, so I started in the studio when I was 17 or something like that. I was assisting. I had to make tea for like, it was a big studio and like loads of big sessions, like 14 musicians and, you know, it was, uh, and I had to make tea for like 10 people and things. And I had a system with the, with the handles and the color of the mugs and things like that to know which one wanted two sugars and, <laughs> and, and all that. So even it, then, even a, then, you were designing workflows around tea making because <laughs> we've been to your yeah. place and we've seen how how important workflow is to you. And I, I think, do, do you think Absolutely. that do you think that's made a difference into the way that you approach engineering? Because I mean, you, you strike me very much as a person who sees, you know, a, a bunch of repetitive tasks or something where it's not quite working the way, and you'll just figure out a way to make it work better. 
Yeah, sometimes I would spend more time on figuring it out um, than it would take me to just do it manually. Yeah. But, uh, but I enjoy that, and that led me to, you know, uh, working at Waves and developing tools uh, and, you know, plugins and products and stuff. So, so yeah, it's a bit more nerdy than the, the usual, the normal kind of musician, I would say. Uh, and um, yeah, I started engineering. Uh, after, so I, I, you know, I didn't end up assisting in that studio for long because I I was really lucky and and the very big artist um, that I was assisting uh, on 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 the session. The engineer got a phone call and had to leave. And the producer asked me, do you think you can take over the session? It was a guitar recording, a guitar overdubs and stuff. He said, yeah, no problem. And I was like uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> shitting my pants, basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, I managed, but I managed to somehow do it. And, uh, and I ended up co-producing the album and engineering the, the whole album and all that. So, so after that, and that was like maybe after... I, three, four months that I've been in the studio. Right, even. it's a big break. Uh, so after that, uh, I didn't want to go back to being an assistant because I worked with this big artist already as an engineer. You know, I was like 18 or something. Um, and uh, so I left the studio to become a freelance, uh, which was a bit premature because I just sat by the phone and nothing happened because no one knew me, basically. <laughs> Um, uh, but then things uh, started to 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 pick up, and uh, I started uh, engineering loads and loads and loads, and producing as well. Uh, and obviously, I play guitars in and and everything else in usually in my productions, unless it's a band or something, and then I let them play. <laughs> Uh, interesting. So, I mean, you've got a lot, I mean, a lot of experience and a lot at, at an early age. So, I mean, it makes sense that you kind of know what you're doing now. I mean, and is that what gives you the most pleasure? Some is people it, say that. It is what gives you the most pleasure? Is it the? Is it the? Because it, it feels like, in many ways, you know, like this track almost is. You've got some basic building blocks, and you're, but you're designing this kind of workflow, almost inventing a thing out of some disparate parts. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying this a lot. So, in many ways, you know, what you're doing on a daily basis in terms of mixing is kind of so problem solving. Or what gives you the most pleasure? Is it the? Is it that? Is it the writing? Is it the? Or is it the, the combination of all of those things? Yeah. So uh, I'm very lucky because I, you know, I, I kind of. I'm accompanying the produ production process from start to finish. So from, from designing the plugins and the products that will be used in the production through to writing, uh, like through writing, uh, producing, mixing, mastering. Right. Um, <laughs> You know, and doing uh, Dolby Atmos kind of post-production work and things like that. So, so it's the whole, pro the entire process, and I and I really love every stage of it. So I get a lot of mastering um, from other people, um, which I, you know, it's the first time I'm hearing the song, and I had nothing to do with it, and it's great because a it takes it doesn't take too much time so you get to work on a lot of songs yeah re relatively uh, as opposed to a production that can take you i don't know three months or or something um but but i love mixing and that's something i do a lot as well mm. um remotely but i have been doing it remotely for years uh, as well as having people here obviously now it's a little bit more complicated especially people who coming uh, who come from abroad i love writing uh, and i love designing the the products you know the the more nerdy kind of uh, aspect of it so uh, and i and i'm very lucky because I don't have to do just one yeah, of those I think that, things. Yeah. I get to do them all. 
So uh, it's not like one repetitive thing that you, oh yeah, Yoad's the guy yeah. that you go to who's, uh, you know, who does that and then you end up just doing that. I can totally understand that. That makes total sense. Yoad, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. I, I, I mean, for those of you who haven't already downloaded the album, please go uh, Bandcamp. Uh, the link will be below. It's uh, Sonic001. Uh, I'll put all the details in the show notes. But it's been great talking to you, Yoad. Thank you ever so much. Uh, My and pleasure. I hope people have enjoyed your track as much as I have. But I'll be waiting right here for you, for you Why is it suddenly worth it, even if I could be wasting my time Oh yeah, if you were ever uncertain then I have to try